of psychology and pop culture had a baby, they'd call it shrink tank. A new paper reveals more intelligent people are quicker to learn and unlearn. 90 percent chance that there's some like weird animal out there. Yeah. Alan Stern's been doing this forever and far more extreme. From Nashville and Charlotte, this is the Shrink Tank Podcast. Welcome, welcome, everybody. If you're joining us for the first time, a very special welcome to you. And if you're coming back for more, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Verhagen here in Nashville. We have got a great show for you. Our trending topic today is Robin Williams and his documentary, Come Inside My Mind. That's in our second segment. But first, we're going to meet our Charlotte panel with the absence first of Frank Gaskell. Moment of silence. Hello, darkness, my old friend. There we go. All right. Dr. Emma Kate Wright is here. Emma Kate, how are you? I'm doing excellent. How are you today, Daver? I'm doing awesome. Since we're going to talk about Robin Williams, who now in uh, pop culture, actress, actor, comedian, who makes you laugh? Um, do they have to be alive? Well, not necessarily. I always loved Chris Farley. He and my brother would just absolutely lose it watching some of his stuff, like Black Sheep and Tommy Boy, and I feel like those are such classics. But I also really like South Park, but that's not a person. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> well, you, you be a, a what? You just can't answer Dave directly. He, no. He asks you a question, and you're like, do they have no. to be alive? I know. And then I here's a cartoon. Well, I guess I, there's not really that many funny people you, right you know, now. Dave, here's like a commercial that Tina I really Fey. find funny. I like Tina Fey. There I like her go. a lot. That's a good one. She's good. That was a good one. Jonathan Hederley, you just heard from him. He's our certified Asian who rounds out our panel. And Jonathan, first, how are you doing? Well, David, I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. You're doing, you're doing well? Oh, yes. Thank you. Actually, one thing that we will say is, I did something that uh, I've never done before, and that is I booked a flight and flew to another state just to watch a concert. And Jonathan picked me up at the airport, and we went to see Arcade Fire. And, it was pretty and, fun. And was it worth it? It was worth it, yeah. They delivered. I will say uh, the beginning of the concert was rock star awesome. Then they started playing like songs that they hadn't played before and songs that were off their demo and things like that. So there's about three or four songs where it just kind of the energy dropped out of it and then they let loose and the rest of it was great. So I would say out of the two hours, probably an hour and a half. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I would I would say. Cool. So so Jonathan, same question for you. Who makes you laugh? Well, I, I, I do like lowbrow comedy, I will admit. So I have this guilty pleasure of Comedy Central roast, celebrity roast. So someone like Jeff Ross, and when somebody just like just pummels a celebrity, I find that really satisfying. But the comedian right now that to me just can't do any wrong is John Mulaney. He's got a bunch of Netflix specials. He wrote, helped create Stefan for Bill Hader. He right now is my favorite comedian. Mine too. I watched the most recent one. Is Kid Gorgeous the most recent one? Yeah. Yeah, and it is one of the best stand-up specials I've ever seen. It is it is a classic. Good stuff. All right. Well, Jonathan ro rolls through the internet each week, and he finds a great story of psychology in the news for our first segment that we call Being Human. What is it about roller coasters that some people love so much? And is it an experience we tend to like less as we get older? Um, so some researchers are trying to figure out the psychology of roller coasters. Uh, do people enjoy roller coasters because it's linked to sensation-seeking behavior? Is our enjoyment related to speed? There are two different studies and they explored some different relationships and on why we love roller coasters. One uh, explored the relationship between uh, roller coasters and use stress, positive stress. And the other study looked at the impact of dopamine levels on sensation-seeking behavior. So, Emma Kate, two questions. First, do you love roller coasters? And the second question is, what are your thoughts about why people love roller coasters? Okay, so yes, I absolutely love roller coasters. So here in Charlotte, we have Carowinds. And I used to go there when I was little. My grandparents would get us season passes for the summer. 
And I was always so angry that I wasn't tall enough to go on the upside down coasters. And so as soon as I could, I was constantly riding like the most intense ones you could possibly get at. And there was one time somewhat recently, actually, a couple of years ago where another coworker here um, we went into Carowinds one day and we, all we did was ride like the biggest ride. I think it's called the Fury. Um, at the time it was the, bit, the best. And we just kept going in the single rider line over. And I, I think I rode it like 15 times, maybe within like two hours. Wow. And I had the worst motion sickness when <laughs> I got home that night. Like I would close my eyes and I'm still riding the coaster. Um, so obsessed with coasters and, You know, I think a lot of what some of this research was talking about is true. Like, we all really like that thrill. Um, I enjoy kind of that moment when, like, your stomach drops on the ride when you go down um, the really – that first steep um, incline. And – but at the same time now, I can't handle it as well as I used to when I was younger. And um, I wish I could, but I definitely start to get kind of dizzy. And I guess my middle ear is not as – fluid as it used to be but um yeah (laughs) it's got to be though the scare factor because you're doing the stuff that is like insane like that's the that's the appeal of the roller coaster right it's not just the sensation of it and you're going upside down that's a little bit of it it's just like oh it kind of feels like i could die here Mm -hmm. i i have that thought there's two thoughts and experiences i have every time i ride a roller coaster there's a moment where i'm like is this the time is this the the time when this roller coaster has a fatality that's one thought i always have (laughs) and then the other experience i always have at some point is regret like oh i i wish i wasn't doing this but then there's always the euphoria (laughs) That overrides that to the point like, let's write it again. But I always have the, am I going to die? And this was a mistake. Yep. And the great thing is that those are benign experiences. It's like, that's the best type of regret. Like that really. You no, know, it's true. Like what's the worst case scenario? Uh, well, like vomit. Well, and it's like the difference between like now the nice steel coasters versus the older wooden coasters. Like I am scared to death on the wooden coasters because I don't I feel know, safe. I know because they feel like, like they I, could fall no, apart. Like I literally like my butt lifts up off the seat sometimes and like all that's holding me inside of this little cart is this tiny little metal like stick. Well, I'm sure lifting your butt doesn't help safety. Emma <laughs> I don't know why that No, I literally am like floating response. in the air and the only thing that's keeping me like in the little cart is this little stick. I don't feel safe so I'm going to stand up. That's uh, more I'm not safe. standing. I'm floating because it's so intense. Are you making intense. space for all the crap when you crap your pants? Is uh, that what you're doing? I know. I know. Well, Frank's not here, so I, this makes sense. I'm getting roasted, but the uh, the the worst experience on a roller coaster I've ever had was down in Texas. I think it was San Antonio. They had a, ra- a roller coaster called the Rattler at the time. I think it was the the largest wooden roller coaster, something like that. And I kid you not, it was like my head was an independently moving object from my body. Like mm-hmm. my head could have been like five feet away from my body. My head was just like, gah, 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 and my body is just mm-hmm. vibrating and all this stuff. And you get all, and you feel like you've been in a, in a prize fight. It was the weirdest thing. The other experience, were either of you with me when I went to the Harry Potter world and rode the, the loop de loop roller coaster there? Nope. I don't think you, I was on the, I was there with you, but not for that ride. Okay. So I rode it twice in a row and I literally walked off the roller coaster and laid on the concrete and not like in a histrionic way. Like I can't walk any further. I had to lay in the middle of everybody on the concrete and during the ride, you know how it is like when you have that vomit thing Mm -hmm. where it's like (laughs) if if one little synapse fires in my head i'm just like it's projectile vomiting like your mouth starts the entire ride yeah like it's like that mustard uh like (laughs) when you smell or taste mustard and you feel that the corners of your mouth turn up and the all that Mm -mm. yeah all that Mm -mm. yeah felt that the entire ride and then just laid out on the on the concrete but i'd do it again well and that's the thing like i love roller coasters but like you, Emma Kate, I used to ride them constantly, and now I need recovery time in yep. between. So I used to get all flustered by long lines and waits, and now I need them mm-hmm. to kind of convince myself, like, oh no, the next one's not going to kill me. The next one's not going to be that synapse where I projectile vomit because I feel more and more unsettled after each 
roller so coaster ride. So is that is that a psychological thing or a, or a physical thing for you? I think it's a physical thing. I think it's just just age uh, for whatever mm-hmm. reason, like my recovery from gene, just being herky jerked around so much and going up and down. Like I I I, I have more nausea response now that it just too. takes a little bit I don't know longer. What that is. Yep. I don't know either. Why but, is that? Like, what is the deal? Like when you get older, that you get more nauseous on a roller coaster. Why? I'm, I'm pretty sure part of that, and I mentioned this, is the the little bones in your ear, the middle ear, you start to get more prone to the vertigo and dizziness because it becomes more solidified. And so then, you know, if you're feeling a little bit more wobbly and woozy, then it might make you feel more nauseous. But I'm, I need to check my facts on that. But. Well, it makes sense I, to me. And, it's, and I experience it the older I get. I grew up 45 minutes from Bush Gardens, which has probably the best collection of roller coasters anywhere. And we would go all the time during the summer and we would ride the Loch Ness Monster back to back to back to back. And we would do it. And, and then as, when I got older and I went there as an adult, I could do it one time. And it was like, all right, done. <laughs> like that's the whole day done. Yep. So there's something weird about it. But I think to answer the big question, I think the reason that we love them isn't just like, hey, I'm upside down or, hey, this is a cool sensation, but it is the the terror of it. It's the it's the 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 fact that or not the fact, but the the possibility that something horrible will happen and that we kind of know that it won't, but we kind of feel like it might. There's something about that that's really appealing. It's like a, it's watching the scary movie. It's the same thing as why we, we like to go see horror movies, I yep. think. Yep. Well, we, we'd love to get your questions or comments. And if you have any about roller coasters or any of our conversation, you can write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. We'd love to get your comments and we'll react to them. Let's move on to our trending topic. Our trending topic today is Robin Williams. He has a new documentary or they have a new documentary about him out called Come Inside My Mind. And um, I want to go around first and ask if you've had a chance to see it. Emma Kate, have you seen the documentary? I have. What's your quick review or quick take on the documentary itself before we talk about Robin Williams? Um, I really enjoyed it, but I think the portrayal of it was kind of a reflection of how a lot of people viewed Robin, where it's like he's such a giant ball of energy, and yet you don't really get to know what's going on inside of his mind, even though literally the title of the documentary is Come Inside My Mind. We don't really get a lot of insight there. I think that's a great observation. That's probably the biggest criticism I have is that the title invites you to to have a deeper understanding of him, and I'm not sure that you do. Yep. I think you understand the trajectory of his life and career, but not mm-hmm. necessarily understand him. Jonathan, you saw it. What'd you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Emma Kate. I actually wrote a review for Shrink Tank and the title of it's, it fails to live up to its name. Like I think from a visual standpoint, everything it provides is very interesting and enjoyable. It just doesn't deliver the goods. And so I loved all of his early work that it shows, but I don't feel like I know Robin Williams any deeper. And to me, I, I think one of the limitations, and I don't know if there was a way around it, but you really don't get a lot of of commentary or, or interviews with most of his family. So it's really his first wife that gives the most insight. And that that's from like 30 years ago, right. you know, before he had his celebrity. And then he has his son, Zachary, comments a little bit, but his other wives, his other kids, they really aren't a part of it. And I feel like they also, I mean, they talked very candidly about like his alcohol and drug use and all these other things. And But even, you know, because it, it really, um, for those who haven't seen it yet, it starts at the beginning of his life, you know, kind of a little bit of background on his childhood where we know he's pretty much kind of a quiet kid and was an only child, I think. Is that correct? Yep. And so, you know, he had to come creative and figure out his own stuff. Um, and then towards the end of his life, you know, they don't really talk that much about the Lewy body disease um, and the dementia. And I feel like that there were so many opportunities for them to try to give more insight into, you know, the addiction or into um, some of the brain-based stuff that was happening um, towards the end of his life, and they didn't. And I don't know if that's just because they felt like they couldn't speak to it because they weren't sure or or what, but I didn't. I wish they missed an opportunity there. That's my thought too, is there's a lot there from a mental health standpoint and just a general 
sort of deeper understanding standpoint that just didn't get explored. The the whole um, of a two hour documentary, there was maybe maybe ten minutes dedicated to the end of his life, and a lot of that was just people talking about the last time that they talked to him. Um, it wasn't a lot of insight. We don't know just from watching it what Louis body dementia is that much. Uh, we don't know how that's distinguished from Parkinson's that much. Um, we didn't hear a ton about his addiction except that he acknowledged it and we don't know much past that. So yeah, that, that, that I feel like was what I was hoping for with the documentary. And in fact, when we were planning to talk about this, we were like, we're going to, we're going to kind of do a deeper dive into Robin Williams, but I don't feel like the stuff that we're going to talk about today really is derived mostly from the documentary. I think it's from other sources. Yeah, I, uh, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, but there were some good things about it. There were some interesting parts to the documentary. It's probably worth seeing. It's not, I, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a, it's an A. It's, it's a, you know, Jonathan, you said before we recorded, it's probably in the B range Yeah. or so. I, I, I think that's probably fair, but let me just kind of shift to not just talking about the documentary, but about Robin Williams himself. What is your, just from watching and from other things that you've read and from researching to get ready for here, what are some of the things that stand out to you about Robin Williams as a man, as a person? What are some of the things that really strike you? Um, Emma Kate. Well, I think he was truly a good person who tried hard. Um, I think he was very giving and generous of his time. He did a lot of philanthropic work. Um, and, you know, I, I think he was a good person. You know, he was a flawed human like any of us. And um, at the same time, though, I feel like there were so many, like he had so much energy and he had to have affirmation from people laughing um, and that was what uh, kind of filled his cup, so to speak. And if he didn't have that, you know, it seemed like he wasn't satisfied. And and one of the things I, I really only knew Robin Williams through his film work and the documentary mostly talked a lot about his comedy, um, like actual stand up comedy and some of the television stuff he did, which I never watched Min Mork and Mindy or any of that. Um, but it was just interesting to see how, you know, he was just truly manic on stage, like running around like a chicken with its head cut off. Yeah, I, by all accounts, he was a very lovable person, like very approachable, warm, kind. I don't think the documentarian had to work hard to get people to talk affectionately about Robin Williams. By all accounts, he was just a, a really decent person. And I think that translated to his comedy. He, he, he wanted to make people laugh. And in some ways... That could be a very altruistic or giving act. And then the other was to, for him to, to make people laugh was making a connection with them because there was something about, it sounds like loneliness and, and growing up as an only child of yearning for some type of connection that could sustain him. And it never really could. You, you always saw him needing to continually make people laugh, needing to continually have projects and things to fill his life because when he was just sort of quiet or still, it, it really seems like he had a lot of inner demons and struggles that he needed to distract and fill up through laughter and projects and things of that nature. People definitely liked him. Fellow comics uh, revered him, but they also liked him on a personal level. You know, you heard from uh, Billy Crystal, who just said, I had no agenda. I just liked the guy. I just wanted to be near him. You had David Letterman. You had Bobcat Goldwaith. You, uh, you had all... Th this kind Steve of Martin. cast of uh, Steve Martin. You had this this cast of comics that was amazing, who just liked him as a person. But the interesting thing, thing that struck me about it, not just in the documentary, but other things I've read, is it just feels like this is a guy that had a really hard time doing life. Um, he seemed like a very poorly attached person, if you think about. Like, he was uh, early on kind of isolated, alone. Then he... Um, was living with Elaine Boozler, the mm -hmm. the comic, but had another girlfriend somewhere else that he was lying about. Mm -hmm. Then he got married, 
and he's been married. He was married three times. And in each case, kind of not really abandoned, but sort of just drifted off and was having a separate life, not a hidden life necessarily, but a separate life. And um, even at the end, his son, who spoke very glowingly of him, which I'm glad for, but basically said, my dad was a very generous man and we had to split our time with him and other people that he was generous with. So it was kind of like we saw him half the time because not only was he working, but he was out doing things for other people other than us. So it just felt like a guy that that had a real hard time maintaining close interpersonal relationships, but desired them at the same point. Um, I want to comment on what you just said about his son, Zach. Um, he made a statement specifically saying that we had to share our dad with everyone. And he said that's something that we got used to over time. And it was like he was saying he accepted it, but I actually made a specific note about this when I was watching it because his face, I mean, you could just tell it just ate his son up, truly, even though he yeah. was like, yeah, yeah, we, this is great. My dad's this wonderful human and we just accepted it. But it was like he just looked so wrecked about it. Yeah. And, and by all accounts, it, it, it seems like Robin tried to make the effort. He tried to make the effort to get clean after John Belushi's death, tried to be more of a domestic person after Mork and Mindy was canceled. And Steve Martin and a lot of people commented, it just looked really hard for him. So like he was holding, like he was, he was sober, but he didn't look like life was any more enjoyable or easier because of it. It was a real strain. It took a lot out of him just to, to be that straight and narrow. Function. And the other thing that I observed was his dad wasn't around a lot and his mom was a jokester mm -hmm. herself. And so mm -hmm. I'm just curious of like, does, is his attachment, is his connection through making people laugh rather than some of those other typical ways that we would, you know, associate with strong attachment that, so for him, like to be loved and to feel love was to make people laugh and laugh back at him. And that really was born out of that unique relationship that he and his mother had, just being the two of them together for so much of his childhood. That, and then there was a comment in the documentary, too, about his father and how there was, they were watching one, I don't know what show it was, but there's this one scene where, you know, somebody's doing a sketch with a stick and all the different things you can do with the stick. And I don't know who the famous comedian is, but you could tell they were at least trying to make it portray it as though that was kind of this defining thing for Robin where he knew that to be accepted by his father, you know, if he could get him to laugh the way he laughed at that. Yeah, that, that was absolutely true. It's like, that's his, that's his form of attachment. And he came across in the documentary and in other things that we're aware of with him as a fundamentally good guy and a decent guy, but that life was just like, he, he was better on stage than in regular life. He was, shot out of a cannon on stage and was in his element and was a pure shooter in terms of just being, you know, a wild, wide open, funny person. But in regular life, he had to work really hard just for basic attachments. The other thing that struck me too was, and I don't want to make too much of this and I, I, I want to be clear what I'm saying and not saying, but um, in the documentary, you recall there was a part where they showed him with um, filming 24 hour photo. Mm -hmm. And that was a very uh, dark role, very heavy role. And then they would show footage that when they would cut, he would immediately riff and go into all this sort of comic stuff. And the, and the director said, I just learned to let him do it just to kind of get it out of his system. Then we'd be back on for another take. And it would almost be like, he'd be reset and he'd have this glow about him that would carry him into the, the next set. It almost had the feeling, and I'm not saying that he was autistic. I, I don't mean that, but it almost had that feeling of, of being like, you know how um, some folks, they, they have to stem, they do the self stimulating stuff. It's like mm -hmm. that it that builds up. And then when they, when they can't do it, when they're around people, they hold it all in and then they go in their room and then they just kind of pace around and stem and do the thing. It had this very pressured kind of thing about it where it was like, even in time where he, you know, he got nominated for a number of awards for that role. It was, it was a great performance, but even to get there, it was like he had to hold back all that stuff and then 
between takes, he had to be like, I have to do this thing again. I have to do all the riffing and joking and I can't just let it be, you know, it, it had, it, that, that was a very striking thing to me. It reminds me of, uh, Stephen King who has, he has to write, he has to have this, you know, he has to write these certain number of words every day and, and just get that energy and that creativity out in order for him to function. And it, it really reminds me a lot of my, my addict clients that have restless energy and it just needs to be channeled or there needs to be an outlet. Cause if there's not, it really tends to manifest itself in self-destructive ways. Yep. Right. And maybe that's the way to think about it is more like almost like that addictive thing than a self stimming, like a stimming thing, because it, it, what it has the feel of is this, this thing that must get itself out. And if it doesn't, then it's, it, his head's going to pop off. You know, yeah. it, it, it had this kind of driven feel to it. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, there was no, wasn't relaxed. And the contrast was right before he would go on stage he would almost look like you unplugged him and he was like lifeless, like he'd passed out. And then as soon as he would go on stage, then he was shot out of the cannon. And so it was like he, when he knew it was coming, he could then kind of conserve and gear down and then he could do his thing. But when he was doing another kind of task, like a dramatic role, he had to, he had to hold it in so much. Um, it's just a different, really fascinating aspect to his character. Any last thoughts about Robin Williams, the psychology of Robin Williams in particular, before we wrap it up? Well, you know, again, I think we're really, and I wish we had more time because he is such a fantastic, or he was such a fantastic person. Um, but I think so many people, you know, when, when a celebrity commits suicide, there's typically so much about, oh, you know, they couldn't handle the pressure of their life or whatever it is. But I think what people really neglect um, to think about with Robin is that his whole world was, um, you know, his identity was centered on being quick witted and being fast on his feet and being able to, you know, rapidly, you know, spew out these jokes and make people laugh. And, the type of dementia he had, Lewy body dementia, is the um, I think it's the second behind Alzheimer's d dementia um, in terms of common uh, occurrence. But um, you know he literally lost his identity because of that disease. And I think there's so much more that we could probably go into about that. But I think it's important for people to realize that um, you know you start to have like movement issues, you can have hallucinations. I mean, he truly was on the decline. And not just psychologically, like his identity got robbed by it, but there is stuff that happens just on a neurological and biological level that um, makes you fundamentally different. Bobcat made this point in the documentary that his brain was basically not working in, in the way that it had. And um, I mean, I, I've seen this personally. My grandfather, I think, I'm pretty certain at this point had, had uh, Lewy body dementia, but it was early diagnosed as Parkinson's and then Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. And those two things can happen, but the, the characteristics of Lewy body stuff where he would like jump up in the middle of the night on, in his bed and run across his bed and, and dive onto, you know, into the closet across the room or uh, grab my grandmother and, 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 you know, try to choke her cause he thought he was being attacked or some of the cognitive confusion and stuff like that. That's all part of that syndrome. And when your brain's doing that, Louis bodies refers to proteins that, that are in your brain that, that basically cause things to, it affects your motor functioning. It affects your, your cognition and thinking. It affects your emotional functioning. It affects all kinds of stuff. So it's not just a psychological thing of he lost his identity. It was really like, he he really was losing his mind in some ways. Jonathan, any last thoughts for you? No, I mean, I, I, I appreciate what you guys have shared because I think it adds complexity to the question surrounding the circumstances of his death, of whether he truly was in his right mind and how he was processing reality. Because there's, I think there's, 
There's arguments on both sides of the case that that loss of identity and and, and even the, the the pain and the suffering, but also we just know like cognitively was that the Robin Williams making a very um, a, a fully aware decision on his part, and I think that that adds. I I think more than anything that just adds to the tragedy of his loss. Definitely. Well, if you have questions or comments about Robin Williams or the documentary about Robin Williams, we hope you'd write us at feedback at shrinktank.com. We'd love to get your questions or comments. Let's move on to our final segment, which is our doctor's orders. These are things that we're personally enjoying in pop culture, and we want to recommend to you. So, Emma Kate, what do you have? So I am going to recommend the documentary we were just talking about, HBO's Come Inside My Mind. Um, even though there were, there were things that were maybe quote unquote missing, it was funny. I mean, there was a lot of really laugh out loud clips that were in there and I did enjoy it. Um, so I think it's it's worth checking out. Jonathan. I want to recommend a TV show on Netflix. It's called Babylon Berlin. It is a 16 episode. It's actually two seasons. It is the most expensive German television show ever produced. And it is wildly entertaining and suspenseful. It takes place in 1929. It has to do with blackmail and governmental conspiracy to overthrow Stalin and the Soviet Union by basically a bunch of rebels that are congregating in in Berlin. It's super intriguing. I highly recommend it. It's called Babylon Berlin. And I want to recommend two reality shows. I've recommended them before on the podcast, but they're both on for summer. And one is So You Think You Can Dance. I know Jonathan laughs every time I recommend it, but I love the show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they're now moving into uh, the finalists. So you can jump right in and enjoy it. And it's definitely worth watching. Also, American Ninja Warrior. I forgot how good that show is. Uh, we had a little bit of a lull in terms of stuff that we'd recorded. And so we picked up an episode that we DVR'd and we're back into the season. Really good season. Just a very good show to, to watch. A highly enjoyable show. So we hope you'll check out shrinktank.com for great articles and videos. You can also find links to some of our Doctor's Orders products uh, that we recommend on the podcast. We also hope you'll follow us on Twitter at shrink underscore tank. And please like us on Facebook. For questions or comments, you can drop us a note. Our email is feedback at shrinktank.com. Our producer and theme music composer is Sean Beck. And our associate producer and social mu- media guru is Mariel Butler. For Emma Kate Wright, Jonathan Hederley in Charlotte, I'm Dave Verhagen in Nashville. Tell all your friends about us and make it a great week. <laughs> <laughs>